personally and professionally, I like to stay in my lane. So I will tell you that our next speaker has something to do with football. I don't know why. Okay, not my thing. All right. But Maurice Claire is joining us tonight. He's an entrepreneur, a public speaker, a consultant, someone who connects with clients to bring a message of empowerment and preparation. And he also happens to be a member of the Archway Institute Board. So ladies and gentlemen, I present to you Maurice Claire. Glass. It's hard to come up after you, right? <laughs> um, now, um, one, uh, thank you all for allowing me to be here uh, and to speak. Uh, as I was sitting here, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm requested to call to speak all over the country, uh, many different universities, businesses, high schools, grade schools, everything. And um, every time I'm asked to speak, people tend to want to speak about like the glorious parts of my life, about how I've gotten better and. They want me to encourage people and motivate people. Uh, but I was talking to Dan uh, prior to this, and I said the reason I like coming to Archway events is because it just connects me to what basically helped me to turn myself around. You know, uh, it is like in my mind when I come here and I look at the struggles, and I look at when I'm drunk outside my mind, when I've been taking pills outside my mind, when I'm smoking weed outside my mind, like coming into this space and seeing God's recovery, like this, like, energy of this phase or this space is what got me better. You know what I'm saying? Uh, I don't have to be like the fictitious guy with the cool suit, the cool tie, and come and encourage everybody. Like, I've been through a lot of shit. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> you know, I'm sorry for cussing, but I meant to cuss. You know what I'm saying? Uh, and all the guys in the back who stood up, y'all know what I'm talking about, right? <laughs> and when you try to get yourself together, you, you, you confuse and you stress your family out and you run everybody crazy. Um, that's the real stuff, not Maurice Claret running businesses and philanthropists, that stuff is nonsense. You know, and, uh, I just want to tell you a little bit about myself and tell you my connection to uh, Archway and, and hopefully, um, hopefully encourage some people. But uh, to make a long story short, I got about 15 minutes I love to talk, so I put a timer on, right? <laughs> um, but in, in, in a nutshell, just, I don't want to drown everybody out with my childhood, but grew up in Youngstown uh, like any other kid. Um, you know, came up, wanted to be a football player, basketball player, anything that you could possibly name. Uh, bumped my head a bunch as a kid, went to the juvenile facility uh, three times. Uh, as a result from going to the juvenile facility a few times, there's a gentleman who invested in me, his name was uh, Mr. Roland Smith, uh, who eventually turned me and put me on the track towards uh, football. Uh, in the process of that, I didn't realize that I had a gift of any sorts. I started playing football, I had a tremendous amount of success as a freshman in high school. I uh, ended up starting the varsity team and doing very well for my time being there. Eventually transferred schools uh, in about the 10th grade. I ended up basically going out uh, to another school where they were playing like predominantly uh, higher division one level guys. And I ended up starting there and doing very well my sophomore, junior, and uh, senior year. I eventually became to be the uh, number one football player in all of America, uh, leaving high school. Uh, I went down to Ohio State. Uh, as a freshman, I ended up starting uh, at, on, on, on basically on my four Ohio State football team. And to make a tremendous story short, uh, I basically went out, won a national championship, and I had the world in the palm of my hands. And in the process of uh, winning the championship, I've kind of lost focus. You know, I kind of got caught up to the sex, the drinking, the drugging, and, and just the party life. And with all, or what most kids do once they have a lot of success in college. And so from there, uh, going into my second season after taking all these crazy benefits, the NCAA comes in, uh, they investigate me, and as a result from that, uh, they suspended me indefinitely. And that's kind of like where my story starts. That's why I kind of like ran through all this stuff kind of fast. And um, when the NCAA has suspended me, this is the first time in my life that I can remember uh, myself being depressed or being stressed. Uh, going home at night, not being able to sleep, staying up 24 hours, being restless, just really being out of my mind. And I didn't realize it at the time, but what I was substituting, what I was substituting that feeling with was going out to the nightclubs, hanging out all night, drinking, smoking, and drugging, uh, because it was the only thing that entertained me. And so just to put it in context, to go from the top of the world with a national championship and being like one of the best players on that team to now having nothing, to having no money, to having no friends, to being disassociated from my peers, uh, it was a tough thing for a 19-year-old kid. 
And so as a result from that, uh, I remember partying, going crazy, and I was uh, actually in Vegas. And uh, Jim Brown, uh, legendary Jim Brown football player for uh, Cleveland Browns, he had ran into me, and he said, Maurice, man, you shouldn't be out here uh, basically living how you're living. And so he said, could you come to California and basically let me allow you to uh, basically turn yourself around, let me put an infrastructure around you, and help you to basically move in the right direction. So when I get to California, to make another long story short, uh, I kind of avoided him, moved away from him, uh, and just didn't basically want to fit into the program that he had for me. And so I did the same thing I did in Ohio, I'm partying, I'm having fun, watching time go by, watching time fly, uh, and two years pass by. So when two years pass by, I'm now legally eligible uh, to enter the NFL draft. I've been three years removed from high school, or yeah, three years removed from high school, uh, the NFL calls me in January of 2005. They asked me to come trial uh, over in Indianapolis. I go to Indianapolis. I basically go to the combine and do a horrible job. And I'm not believing that I will get drafted. So uh, that's January, February. April comes up. Um, to make another long story short, uh, the Denver Broncos called me in the third round. And they had drafted me with the 101st pick. And so initially when I got picked, I was like, okay, this is awesome, this is cool. Uh, I got drafted, this is like a childhood dream. But then there was another part of that uh, where I was like, dang, you know, I have so much pressure to perform and I know for a fact that I hadn't prepared to basically be the athlete that they had wanted me to be. So I go to, um, I go to uh, different Broncos and I'm in training camp and throughout the first three or four days, I can remember myself, I'm like, man, you know, I'm not gonna be able to make it because my body's beat up from taking so many prescription pills. I want to party all night, I want to hang out with the football players in the morning, I want to party at night, I want to do everything that I'm not supposed to do as a professional. And I was basically kind of like running myself into the ground. So they had approached me, uh, like most people get approached, they said, hey, you know, can we help you out? You know, you've been through a lot before you got here. Can we help you to adjust? Can you sit down with a sports psychologist, right? And so at that time, I thought like, you know, what is talking to somebody, what is like talking to an individual going to do? How is that going to help me, right? I didn't realize that they had a deeper understanding of what I had been through before me coming to the Broncos. So I rejected my help and I began to basically move on throughout the preseason. I get to the game, we're about to play the Indianapolis Colts, and they sit down like at an intervention way and they say, hey, Maurice, can we help you again? Uh, can we go to the practice squad? And when you go to the practice squad, can you please work with the sports psychologist for a whole year? And what they were trying to do was like try to intervene, help me out, get me on the right track, and push me in the right direction. But what I heard in my mind was that, you know, you're not doing the right thing, let us kind of control your life. And I was like, we're resistant to the process. And so what eventually happened was uh, we go out, we play the uh, Indianapolis Colts, and the next day they called me and they cut me. And so they cut me, uh, I go back to the hotel, obviously confused and mad and stressed and depressed. Uh, I get a little bit of I go to California, and I remember when I got there that night, I remember me going out to a party. This is kind of like rock bottom. People are talking about rock bottom. I remember this being one of those moments. I remember getting high and drunk, like smoking the blunt, drinking, and going to the party. And I remember being in the party, but I remember I didn't feel drunk or high, right? And that's when I knew I was like, man, this is crazy. Like, how can you smoke a whole blunt and drink and then not feel it? I just knew something was like wrong with me. So the next day, uh, mid -top, midway through the day, I get on the phone, I call my old high school, my old college football coach, uh, which was Coach Trussell, and I say, Coach Trussell, like, I'm lost. Like, can you please help me out? I need some direction. I need to basically get into the right direction. Uh, can you please help me get on the road uh, to basically get my life back in order? So the next thing that happens, I come back to Ohio, we sit down, we have like a three hour conversation. And inside that conversation, uh, he always asked, like, you know, let me give you some takeaways. Let me give you an actionable step to take, you know, once we leave. And so the first thing he said was, hey, Maurice, I need you to go back to school, uh, get your education, and basically, you know, get your life back on track. And the second thing I need you to do is basically get back in shape, uh, because you're not in shape how you were when you were as a kid. And so the first option wasn't really an option to me, because I was pushed through school since, like, the ninth or tenth grade. So I didn't read very well. You know, I had the coaches who, you know, proctored the ACT. You know, when I tried like a 12 or 13, I had people push me through academically the whole time. So going to college wasn't a real deal, right? But athletically, I could go out here and train. And what eventually happened was I would go and train. I would have so much free time during the days and just basic stuff like when you're addicted to stuff. I mean, like, we saw that, all right? Uh, I, I couldn't take care of myself, right? So I couldn't take care of myself. I go to train during the day. So what do I do? I revert back to the same little kid who was robbing, stealing, breaking in homes, and selling drugs. I revert back to that same person. 
And as a result from that, I ended up catching the robbery case on December 31st, 2005, transition into 2006, right? So fast forward uh, into 2006, uh, it's about seven or eight months. Uh, I'm waiting to go to trial. I'm waiting to uh, uh, basically uh, um, see if I'm going to get convicted of the crime that I committed. And uh, the legendary arrest that uh, some people may have seen on TV or have seen in uh, on the ESPN documentary, I'm about to explain like the story to you, right? So I'm coming down, this is August 6, 2000, August 9th, 2006. I'm coming down to Columbus, midway through the night, about 3 in the morning. Uh, and um, obviously I've been drinking. I'm, I'm not drunk, but I'm, I've been drinking the whole time. Uh, I'm, when I'm getting ready to go do what I'm going to do, uh, I pull off on the side of the road, or I get off on the wrong uh, exit, I pull to the stoplight, I make a U-turn uh, in the middle of the street. And as I make the U-turn, there was a police officer uh, who was in the Home Depot parking lot. He had basically seen us like two or three in the morning. And as a result from that, uh, he pulls out and he basically gets behind me and pulls me off to the side of the road. This is like so I'm going to the side of the road. And so in that meantime, I'm thinking to myself, like, man, as soon as I pull over and he pulls over and gets out of the car, I'm going to pull off and basically I'm going to chase him. At least I'm going to head start. So, <laughs> yeah, right. So I'm kind of rushing. Right, so we go, I've got a couple more minutes, right? Um, so I pull to the side of the road, I'm thinking that this is actually going to happen. So he gets behind me, pulls me over, he gets out the car, I pull off, I go over the bridge, and as I get, up the bridge, as I get over the bridge and get onto the on ramp, he's right behind me. So running down the road, um, he's right behind me. Next thing I know, there's three or four cars behind me. I make a U-turn, I begin to come back uh, towards the city of Young, not the city of Youngstown, the city of Columbus. Police officers get out the car, they throw the spike strips down, they bust the tires down. And the next thing you know, I'm on the phone with my mother talking about, I'm going to get out the car and have a shootout with the police uh, because my life is like that messed up and I was ready to die. It wasn't for the purpose to kill the police, I just knew if I pulled the gun out of the police that I would be killed. You follow me? There we go, right? So, <laughs> I talk real fast and try to be like a time corrupt, right? But at least you know why not, right? So, to make another long story short, they end up arresting me. I get transitioned to the county jail, and at this point, I know I'm going to prison because I'm out on bond for a first case, and I'm into a, another criminal act that I basically got caught red-handed. And so, what eventually happened was is that I get transitioned to the jail. They take me to um, uh, court maybe that next week, and there was a judge. I can kind of say she saved my life, and she said, "Maurice, I've seen you play football here. I've seen you be in the community here." Uh, something's wrong, you need to basically go get a mental health evaluation. So I go get a mental health evaluation, I get diagnosed with anxiety and depression, uh, or severe anxiety and depression, whatever the psychiatrist has said to me at the time. And since September of 2006, I've been on mental health medication. I think the medication is what actually saved my life, right? And so my first seven months of my incarceration was, uh, I was locked down for 23 hours of the day, like in a nine by four cell. And I think that that was probably the best thing to happen to me. I was able to basically get out of my way. And I was telling a woman who was uh, recording the show, or who was in the recording upstairs, that, you know, sometimes, and I think this even for everybody in recovery, uh, oftentimes uh, you're actually happy when you get captured. You know what I'm saying? And I don't know if anybody back there, I feel you back there. Yeah. yeah. yeah I know, see, I told you look back there, right? <laughs> <laughs> so sometimes you're in your way, but. You can't get out of your way, but you need like some crazy event to happen so you don't get in your way. You follow me? Right? And then I was kind of like happy to get arrested because I'm like, man, I can't get in my way anymore, right? And so what eventually ended up happening was um, I'm locked down all this time. They sent me, they, they, they sent me to seven and a half years in prison. Uh, through the process of doing that, uh, I got the greatest book that I always mention to everybody that I believe fundamentally changed the way I think. It was called As a Man Thinking by James Allen. Uh, it was the most impactful book. It was the first book that I learned that basically where your thoughts are your things. Uh, until thought is linked to a purpose, nothing intelligent shall ever happen. Uh, nothing changed with uh, circumstance and opportunity. The character of a man should be rebuilt up under every condition. Uh, I never in my life, ever in my entire life, life of living, I never thought that basically thoughts are things and that you create your life. And so what happened was I ended up going to prison from the county jail and I ran into another gentleman. Uh, who basically could be a person of some sorts of things, Mr. Kevin Conte. And Mr. Conte was actually from Sierra Leone. And uh, he said, hey, uh, he said, in Sierra Leone, when guys used to get in trouble, uh, we would bring them closer to the village, figure out what's going on, fix them, and basically send them back out. He said, America, when guys get in trouble, you all throw them away. Kind of how they treat people in recovery. You follow where I'm coming from? 
right? And so he said, I'm going to send you to a bunch of courses while you're here uh, to kind of help you back in my order. He said, a bunch of psychosocial and emotional courses. I didn't realize that that was therapy, right? So I started going to the cage of rage, anger, right? <laughs> anger management, thinking for a change, and so on and so forth. And so a lot of people think that prison is just like bare knuckle fighting, tattoos, and all this nonsense. But you do have like, a form of rehabilitation and correction in there. And so from there, I started going to these therapeutic classes, taking medication, waking up early, exercising, working on my mind, body, and spirit. And next thing you know, I started to transform into a different individual when I didn't have all the stuff inside the system, right? And so as a result from it, I started to get better, started to move down the road. And four years later, uh, after a ton of reading and a ton of, ton of rehabilitation, I became a different individual. So I got out of prison in 2012, no, 2010, 2010. Um, went to Omaha, Nebraska for a couple of years, and from there, I ended up basically getting a documentary uh, with uh, ESP in 2013, it was called Young Style Boys. And uh, as a result from there, I went all, went all around the country uh, speaking for a living and basically uh, telling people my story, telling people my journey, and uh, just basically doing everything. But in that process, like, I, have to, I have to talk about this. In that process, I kind of forget about my whole recovery process, right? When I went to prison, uh, the word recovery was the thing. You know what I'm saying? I never associated myself with having a pill problem, a smoking problem, a drinking problem, right? And so when I got out of prison, uh, I had five years of probation from 2010 to 2015, right? You couldn't party, you couldn't go out, you couldn't do anything, and so I abided by those rules. And so in 2015, September, they let me off of probation. So I said, hey, you know, I'm off probation, maybe I can drink, maybe I can hang out now, like maybe I can get loose, right? And so maybe, what is it, uh, probably January, February of 2016, I get pulled over and I got a DUI from drinking and driving, right? I never figured myself to get recovery. And my lady came back to me, she said, you dumb ass, right? <laughs> so that's what right? She said, you know, wait, sorry for cussing again, right? <laughs> it's the truth of what happened, though. You know, it's the truth of, this is what humbles you, you know what I'm saying? And she said, you can't see that you weren't drinking and drugging during this whole time, you had no problems. Now you put this stuff back into your life, now you have problems. Throw up coming from. Yeah. And so oftentimes when you in it, you can't see yourself, but other people see you better than yourself. You don't want to let something go, right? And so I had a long talk, talk to myself, like, man, like you really like F yourself over, like and got back into this nonsense. And from there, I said, you know what? I said, I said F this. I don't want to say that this sounds a little too harsh. I said, F this. You know, I need to get myself back in order. Like a lot of these guys, a lot of these guys are in the back and go through their process. You say F this, I'm better than this. I gotta move past this process. You where I'm coming from? And since then, I've basically been on the right road. And so from there, I was speaking all around the country. Uh, I ended up basically starting a, uh, I ended up starting a, um, what is it called, a transportation company. I had about 12 or 13 trucks at the time, and I was doing some sort of packaging business, but nothing was like ever feeling fulfilling. And then one day, I'll, tell you, I'll talk about what I got into, and then eventually talk about Archway. Uh, but one thing I got into uh, from the process, I went to a speaking engagement one time, and uh, after I was done speaking, there was a gentleman who started speaking to uh, kids about cognitive behavioral therapy, right? And so when he was going through uh, the AMBC, Activate Event, Divine Activity, the Body Reaction and Consequence, I was like, man, you know, how, why are you teaching these kids this? Where did you get this stuff from? I learned this stuff in prison. And he said, well, I work in the mental health and recovery industry. And he said, I run a behavioral health agency. And I was like, you know, what is that? I didn't even know that was a thing. But when he showed me, I was like, man, this is the stuff that saved my life in prison. And I said, this stuff is what actually could help people. I had nothing in my mind, I knew nothing about recovery, that it was a real thing or anything. I was like, man, this information is what changed my life. And so eventually I hired a consultant, I got into uh, recovery services, and really just started working the process. And it was the first time that I actually felt a lot, right? I take mental health medication every day, you know what I'm saying? I've been in recovery, it's been day and been noted about my problems with drugs and alcohol. It was the first time I felt like I was doing something to basically redirect some of the wrong that I had done. And in the process of that, we built what is called the Red Zone where, uh, a Treatment Center uh, in Ohio. We serve adolescents and adults, uh, both in Columbus and Youngstown and some surrounding areas. Uh, and we just, you know, I think we have a phenomenal staff and uh, we, we do some great things, and I, I believe, in Ohio. Uh, but through the process of that, uh, going through that, I met uh, John, and I take my connection here. So I get paid to speak everywhere, and I, I speak a lot slower than this normally. <laughs> <laughs> I promise, I'm trying to press the gas, and I know it's late, right? Um, but, you know, I get paid to speak everywhere, and, 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 I, and, and it's all good. But one thing that initially connected me with John 
um, is that, you know, after being in prison, you know, you're writing 2,200 news all day, so you can tell somebody full of shit real easy, right? I tell you that, like, after being around 2,200 people all day, 600 that you did, but you can tell somebody, like, full, like, full of stuff. So the person who introduced us, he was full of mess, right? But John wasn't. And so after being around John, just hanging around him, right? And this dude seemed like real passionate about recovery, like more than anything, right? And so a lot of times in recovery, you also have a population of people who use people in recovery just as a cash register. You know what I'm saying? God's going through detox, God's going through inpatient, God's going through residential, God's going through recovery homes. And so then after spending time around him and then meeting his family, I was like, this dude ain't in for the hustle because his family is straight. You know where I'm coming from? Like, it, it, yeah, serious, you know what I'm saying? And then, like, so you start to look at these things, and then, like, you start to, like, if you hear or heard him talk about recovery housing, what dudes need for treatment, I connected with it, and I don't normally talk to people on that level. Usually, when people talk to me, it's about football or a touchdown or you strip the ball from somebody or some nonsense. Like, no, it's cool, but it's nonsense, you know what I'm saying? This dude was talking about saving people's lives, helping people out, and I think that they're, like, just a normal human connection from something that I had needed, somebody loved with me, and people love me, I think like that was like my real connection with you. You know what I'm saying? It has nothing to do with money. I don't do this for money. I didn't get paid to come out here and do this stuff for nothing. Um, and then when I met his parents, I said, man, these people are retired. I'm like a person said, these people are retired uh, and they're literally going out here and educating, bringing awareness to people and really helping people to navigate recovery. And everybody, no, like nobody knows like the process of recovery. You know what I'm saying? You have like this big, huge epidemic where you have a bunch of people on drugs. You have 50 different treatment centers. You have 50 different options. You have 50 different programs. You have somebody who wants recovery housing, somebody who wants a treatment center, somebody who wants all this other stuff. And to have them dedicate their lives to go around from countries and cities, and not countries, go around from cities to states to sit down with people and give them education, that is honorable. You know, I can't tell you too many people in Ohio who's doing that, you know, outside of them. I just don't know any other independent organization who is doing it for the pure value of just making families aware that this is what you're doing with your child, or giving people funds to get into recovery. And that's the real reason why I'm here with Archway. You know what I'm saying? And I tell you like this, like sometimes, um, like if y'all ever get an email from Dan, it's like this long. <laughs> sometimes I get the emails like, yo, this is like too much for me. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> but if, if you, the spirit, I, I'm telling you, the spirit of me, uh, the spirit of everybody in here, there's people who need help in here, there's people who need access to recovery. There's people like a, a person coming in recovery, the last thing on their mind that they should be thinking about is how to pay rent. You know what I'm saying? If you've been banging heroin, you've been banging opioids, you've been smoking, you've been drinking, the last thing you're trying to think of is like, yo, how do I get this dude five, six, seven, eight hundred dollars to pay rent? You know, follow me. You know, so the person that gets in recovery should be focused on how do I get well, how do I get stable, how do I get clean, how do I get my mind in the right direction? How do I rest, you know what I'm saying? And having resources to help these people. And like I said, we run a recovery housing, and I don't meet people up. I say, bro, give me 90 days, you're cool, get yourself back together, get on your feet, get your mind right, get in the right direction, because I've been there, you know what I'm saying? And I've been there where I didn't have the help, I didn't have that, that, that person, you know what I'm saying? So I'm with you, I'm with Archway. Uh, anytime, awareness, education, anything that you need before that I could possibly help with, I will be here. And I'm gonna, you states away, but anytime you come to Ohio, I will be here. Um, John, like I said, my man, ain't too many people like you. Ain't too many people like your family. Cope and Jordan and other guys have been recovery. Y'all, my guys, um, they ain't got this in Ohio. I'll tell you like that. A lot of dudes using these guys for money to just run through the bill, but there's something special here. Y'all don't even know it. I go a lot of places. This is something special. Thank you all for showing up. Sorry if I bored some people. I'm happy. I'm happy if I, if I help to inspire some people. Thank you all for having me.